Okay. All right, let's get started. Um, this is, um, what is today? November the 8th, 19th? Oh gosh, missed the day. <laughs> so welcome everyone virtually. Welcome everyone here. Um, and uh, we're on our own tonight. Uh, Father uh, Joe had to be out of town and Father Chuck said he, he thought we could handle it. So um, I guess it's whatever I say tonight goes. Come on in. <laughs> Y'all have to take my word for it tonight, which is is uh, is fine. Uh, we'll get settled with a couple more people just coming in. Um, anyone, any questions? Any uh, any follow up questions or uh, issues or anything uh, from stuff we've talked about before? Questions? Anybody? I'm telling you, I can make up all the answers tonight, so it doesn't matter what you ask. I have to be right. No, no priest to correct me. All right, well, uh, let's get started. Um, I want to, um, tonight's lesson is on morality. It's an overview of morality. It's, it's, kind of, it's a good uh, handoff from our previous uh, section on sacraments, which wound up with uh, uh, holy orders. Uh, and then the week before we had a good discussion on confession and everything. So this this topic, uh, an overview of morality, is a good is a kind of a good handoff from that discussion, and then on into the remaining topics of morality. Um, we'll talk about the Ten Commandments. We'll talk about the Beatitudes. We'll talk about social justice. Um, this this class is intended to kind of just give you some overview. Um, so the way I fashioned it this year, because you guys really seem to enjoy the the give and take and the Q and A and kind of thing like that is lots of questions. So I'm counting on you uh, to help me out tonight, especially since we don't have <laughs> we don't have uh, Father Joe with us uh, to tell us all the right answers. So uh, I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. That being said, tonight's reading is from today's uh, mass readings and has nothing to do with morality. Uh, the topic, <laughs> but I have another ul uh, ulterior motive for uh, for using this as today's uh, scripture. This is uh, Revelation chapter 5 verses 1 through 10. I, John, saw a scroll on the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. It had writing on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a mighty angel who proclaimed in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals, but no one in heaven or earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to examine it. I shed many tears because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to examine it. One of the elders said to me, do not weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed, enabling him to open the scroll with its seven seals. Then I saw standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb that seemed to have been slain. He had seven horns and seven eyes. These are the seven spirits of God sent out into the whole world. He came and received the scroll from the right hand, of the one who sat on the throne. When he took it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each of the elders held a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the holy ones. They sang a new hymn. Worthy are you to receive the scroll and break open its seals, for you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God those from every tribe and every tongue, people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests for our, for our God, and they will reign on earth. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, good and gracious God, thank you for gathering us tonight. Thank you for opening your word. Lord, fill us with a sense of hope and of things to come. Lord, protect us in our, in our daily goings and comings and be with our families. You are our Savior. In your name we pray. Amen. Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Uh, so this reading, um, a couple of ulterior motives. One is that, um, you know, we're reading from Revelation. We have been for uh, a number of days here. Uh, it is the end of the liturgical year, the liturgical year in the Catholic Church. Uh, I think right about the end of November uh, is the end of, uh, of the liturgical year. Then we start uh, a new season. There's seasons within the church year. The church calendar 
is a living, breathing thing. Uh, we have Advent, you know, before Christmas. Uh, we have Lent, uh, that time before uh, Easter. Then we have the Easter season, which is just those three short days of Easter, Good Friday, and, uh, and then Easter Sunday, and Holy Thursday as well. And then we have the in-between time, uh, which is called ordinary time. Uh, and the readings reflect the seasons of the year. You skip Christmas. Please. I skip, skip Christmas, okay. Uh, so um, uh, um, be understanding of that. And, and, uh, and let me remind you, there's nothing ordinary about ordinary time. During ordinary time, which we had been reading, uh, is unfolding the good news, unfolding revelation history uh, through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, so uh, now we're at the end of the liturgical year and reading from Revelation. So, uh, you know, and I know there's usually a lot of questions, especially those that come from non-Catholic Christian uh, denominations about Revelation, about the end of times, about the rapture, about uh, those things. So if you have questions about that, that was a teaser. So if you have questions about that, you want to talk about it either tonight or some other night, we'll be glad to uh, delve into that. It's not a topic that we typically schedule, but certainly glad to talk about it. Um, so the, uh, the other nice thing about that reading, um, you know, Revelation, if, raise your hand uh, if you've ever read the book of Revelation. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? It's, it's hard to read. Uh, it's an apocalyptic type of writing, which means that, that word means hidden, you know, so the, the meaning is, is a bit hidden, and there was reasons for that. Uh, John wrote that uh, book uh, while the church was being persecuted, so only the people who were Christians really understood what he was trying to really say. It was kind of gibberish to non-Christians, um, but it's a beautiful story of hope. Our modern kind of uh, uh, inference about Revelation is that it's about the rapture and about God's wrath and all that sort of stuff, and really not. It's really a book about hope. The real message of the book of Revelation is that we win. In the end, we win. Although persecuted as Christians, as a church, uh, in the end, we get to be with God in eternal happiness. And so that's especially what uh, this fifth chapter in Revelation is talking about, is that uh, Jesus conquers the unknown. What was hidden, Jesus opens and reveals to us. And the angels and the heavens uh, worship God. Uh, and that's a glimpse of what we will participate in for eternity. Um, so really the book of Revelation is, is a book of hope. So... Uh, Questions about that liturgical year, um, book of Revelation, anything like that? Good. Good, because as I said, Father Joe's not here. So we won't <laughs> pretend like we know something that we don't. I'll just make a comment. Okay, say it loud because uh, I've got you on okay. computer here. Can you, can you hear me? Can everybody online hear, hear Darren? Can y'all hear me? Oh. Yes, I can. Oh, great. Okay, Thanks. Good. Yep. I remember the first year that when Advent started, I don't know, this was, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, on the first Sunday of Advent, which is the Sunday after Christ the King, which is coming up this Sunday, Christ the King. And on this Advent Sunday, somebody came up to me and said, Happy New Year. Before Christmas. Christmas. And I'm thinking, what are they talking about New Year? That's the first day of the New Year, the church calendar. I just wanted to emphasize what you already said, Joe. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So church calendar year. And the and the vestments that the church that the priests wear reflect the seasons of the year as well. So that's something else for you to, so to watch. Ask them to move purple. Yeah. So and then right now we're in ordinary time. So the color is green. Green. Good. Y'all been paying attention. Good. So, yeah, the different vestments, uh, <laughs> the different vestments reflect the uh, season of the year. So the lectionary really does live and breathe. It, tell, it unfolds a story week to week. 
Okay, good. Um, so as I said, uh, tonight's lesson uh, really depends on all of you to um, to participate. So um, if you're online, please uh, unmute yourself and throw, you know, holler out. It's okay to interrupt uh, or uh, throw a comment in the chat box. Uh, Anthony's helping me watch the chat box. And, yeah. Okay, we got the Maldens, good. All right, awesome. All right, so what we want to talk about tonight is is uh, is begin our um, section on on morality. Uh, it's important for us to get a sense of uh, the basics of life. I mean, um, Jesus preached a gospel of love, but yet he had expectations that we would have right behavior. Um, so to be uh, to live the Christian life is a practical thing, you know, uh, it's good to love and it's the basis of life, but yet we kind of got to know what the rules are, right? Um, and so we'll unpack a bit of that. Um, the, the general word is morality. So when I say uh, that something is moral, something is moral, what does that mean to you? What does that, what does it mean if I say something is moral? It's morally good. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, she says it's human nature. Okay, good. That's very good because we got more to talk about about that. That's good. What else? When I say something's moral, something's morally good. What does that mean? Uh, integ integrity. There. I have to speak up. <laughs> integrity, having integrity. Integrity. Okay, a person. Awesome. Good. Yeah. I was going to say the good that's like just naturally rooted in someone. So it's not something that you should have to teach or anything like that. It's just good. Okay. Um, any examples in anybody's life where you would say that, like Jade's saying, someone is a good person? actions usually their actions you can when somebody does good things it's the way they just you can you see it yeah i mean it, like good choices good person like being okay. compassionate towards others you know that shouldn't be something that you have to teach you you should just know that if you see someone struggling you should help them awesome good so yeah being compassionate uh and it's an innate uh thing. Uh, can you learn to be a moral person, though? Sure, or not. Yes. How does that happen? Oh, like, taught. Taught. Yeah. You're taught values. Okay, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. And he, uh, my next door neighbor uh, found Jesus. So, um, his morality is His last name <laughs> Okay. John said. Good. Good. So, they, him and his brother were trying to pass. And yeah. found Jesus turning around. Yeah. You can become moral, have good morals, even though at a point in your life after. Okay, good. All right, so money can. Yeah, you can look at the inmates and everything. It's PCI, and all everywhere else. They go in there bad things, or they can they can uh, choose, you know, to better themselves and how many they. Some do, but some of them That's right. Uh, can you be a morally good person and not, but not a Christian? Yeah. Yes. A person that lives the Ten Commandments would be generally morally good. Okay, I'd, I'd agree with you there. All right. Good. 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 Uh, here's your uh, technical definition. Uh, very complicated. 
<laughs> not. Morality means doing what is good and avoiding what is evil. Doing what is good and avoiding what is evil. Do good, don't do bad. <laughs> That's simply what morality is. Uh, and I say simply with tongue in cheek because easy to say, hard to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> and to do it all the time, to be always good is, uh, is a bit difficult. Uh, but, but that's, yeah, that's why we have confession. <laughs> So that's the simplest definition that you can find. And it's the simplest message that Jesus had, right? The good news. Turn from the darkness, turn to the light. Put away your old ways and put on new ways. Uh, so the ways that Jesus is talking about is what we got to talk about over the next several weeks. Is what does that mean in a practical sense in my real, in my everyday life? Ten Commandments, live by the Ten Commandments, easy to say, but when we unpack the Ten Commandments, it's not going to be so easy. Do not steal. Easy, I got that. Well, I kind of played on the internet for, kind of played on the internet at work today for the last, for, for a good uh, more than 10 minutes. <laughs> so I, did I steal time from my employer today? Hmm. I didn't know that was part of the deal when I signed up for the Ten Commandments and said, thou shalt not steal. That's the kind of stuff we're going to unpack as we go through uh, these lessons on morality. Uh, do good, avoid evil. Sounds easy, not, but not necessarily so. Um, am I a good person? Am I doing right? Is this right? Sometimes the gray areas of life make that a difficult question. Sometimes it's relatively easy. Uh, I should vote. I go vote. That's a good thing. I've done a good thing. Well, that's pretty easy. Who do I vote for? <laughs> that's not easy sometimes. Uh, so um, I like that part of Catholicism, that we're very willing to dive into the gray. We're very willing to unpack what it means to be good, to be moral in all these situations. And it's not always black and white. It's not always just real apparent what we should do. How do we go about making those decisions? Uh, what are we called to? Um, when it comes to human actions, things that people do, can we judge? human acts? Can we? Can we? Can we? Yeah. All the time. We kind of do like some brain though to make the best decisions we can. So somebody you know that we know is morally wrong or I mean that's where you either in the Nile branch and try to help them out or weigh them or you try to teach or you know tell your friends and kids and whatnot hey this is not what we okay and what were you saying oh yeah <laughs> learn, learn from learn from other perspectives for instance like I'm the younger of you know I'm 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 not doing that <laughs> did y'all hear it online? Did you guys hear what she said? That's good. She no, I did her, not. No. She said she learned learned from her brother, and she said uh, he got in trouble or whatever. But I'm not doing that. <laughs> How many times have you said that about an older sibling? Yeah, I, I'm the fifth of uh, seven children, so I had a lot to learn from them. <laughs> Negative examples, mostly positive yeah, examples. Right. Don't always situation. Awesome. Yeah, and I, she's saying sometimes you rush to conclusions, and I wish society today, especially today with the fast information we get on social media, that we took more time to discern actions. Can we judge our own actions? Can we be our own judge? Yes. I think we're our own. I mean, I'm personally my worst judge. Yeah. I hear part things that I do 
for that, or uh, you know, look at other people. What I could have done better. What I should have done. You're always hard. Yeah, it's they're saying if y'all can't hear, uh, the, your heart is on yourself. Anybody uh, online want to chime in there? Y'all feel free. Um, can we judge human acts of others or of ourselves? Not supposed to judge, but we do it all the time. Yeah, and I think there's a discern there's there's a difference there between judging a person to say you're no good versus judging a person's acts, which says that action is immoral. Yeah. Right, yeah, good. But you're not gonna come to that conclusion until you witness somebody doing something. Right? Sure. You know, like, once you <laughs> see them doing something that you feel is not right, then that's judgment comes in your mind. Yep. Well, that's not necessarily, in my opinion, I think you can go out the back door and the guys that, uh, are you watching the chat? Chat text. Yeah, throw something at me, please. <laughs> uh, Jade had a little comment here that said, "I mean, I'm a lot of pedestrians." So, yeah. Jade had a little comment here. There has to be consequences for certain actions. And I, I would, I would think something because first of all, I'd be thinking this guy right here is it. Get great closing times in that situation. So yes, <laughs> that's right. You pick your judgment, but you judge your you judge the action, right? You judge the action. Yeah, that's exactly. And going back to the other thing, that guy get, he gets caught and ends up in prison. That time to repent. He can get to have the woman. So, so a couple things. Um, Jade notes that there ought to be consequences for certain actions, and that's why we have laws and uh, um, and, and so and so forth. And yeah, definitely un unpack that, especially as we talk about social justice. Here's what the church says about it: human acts freely chosen and with knowledge of right and wrong can be judged. Human acts freely chosen and with knowledge of right and wrong can be judged. So there's a little bit of a little bit of hooks in there, right? Uh, uh, freely chosen, in other words, if a person's coerced into doing something, or pushed in a direction that, without knowing all the facts, would seem immoral. In other words, uh, for example, a person uh, kidnapped into the um, sex trade or something like that. Um, you know. It's, um, those sorts of things, uh, and full knowledge of right and wrong. So some people who are who, who don't know that a certain action uh, is wrong uh, has less uh, less where we convict that that action uh, less. But uh, if you know what you're doing and you did it anyway, uh, and you knew it was wrong, then society, the church, can judge those actions as immoral. Now, um, that's difficult to say sometimes. I mean, that uh, someone is going to judge the actions of another, that the church is going to judge the actions of a person, uh, and that that's the church's role. That's the church's duty. That's what the church um, is called to do, uh, not out of a sense of persecution, but in a sense of, retro of, of rehabilitation to get that person back on the right road. How do you know you're doing wrong unless somebody tells you? And so that's why the church uh, puts out um, norms of good moral behavior. This is right, this is not right. Abortion is wrong. You know, we're very steadfast on that pillar of truth. Um, so yeah, so we can judge human acts. So we talked a little bit about, um, you know, good people, and y'all have a few examples. What are the benefits of living the moral life? What benefits you from living the moral life? When I was a young, young person, you know, uh, I thought that being an adult would be fun because you're free. You get to do whatever you want. You get to go wherever you want. You get to stay out as long as you want. 
Uh, you get to do whatever you do whenever you stay out as late as you want. Uh, that's not the moral life in general. Um, we are called to a, a holy life, but what do we get out of it if we live that sort of life? Seems kind of boring. What are the benefits of living the moral life? Helps your psyche. Helps your psyche. Okay. Clear conscience. Okay. With the hope for everlasting life. Okay. Very nicely said. What else? <laughs> Let's unpack that though a little bit. Uh, relieves your conscience. What what does that mean? Just know when you chose the right path, instead of the path that may be honor. Yeah. <laughs> More fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because none of us chose that. No. <laughs> right, right, Darren. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Do we have a question? Uh, yeah, Penny said uh, one of the benefits is going to heaven, which is our ultimate ultimate goal how do you tell that to teenagers <laughs> right how do you explain that to teenagers be good because you're going to go to heaven if you're good that's a bit abstract for a young person to get okay jade jade makes a little point here uh Mental health has a lasting effect on physical health and a person's well-being. By living a moral life, it contributes to good mental health, which reflects in all areas of life. Um, and Penny adds in, uh, for kids, bring, bring them up in the church, in the ways of church. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, Jade's making a good point here. Uh, and, and I think it alludes to what you said about the easing your, your, your conscience, um, not looking over your shoulder. I did the right thing, um, and you know I'm I'm trying to trying to live the the upright life. Yeah. So what the what the church tells us is uh, what we gain from living the moral life is true freedom and true happiness. Now I said as a young person, you know you get to do whatever you want. I'm free. But what is freedom? What is freedom? What is true freedom? Free will may vary from person to person. What is true? When do, when do I feel the most free? Stress. I have no stress. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well now that's being relaxed i'm asking you when are you free maybe it's easier to ask when am i truly happy when i've done something what do you when i've done something good for someone else very nice when am i truly happy no guilt yeah jade says no guilt absolutely Contentment, okay. You know, for my, you know, once you're, as is, you know, that's the tough. Contentment, may I use the word grateful as well, when you're truly grateful for what you have? At peace, right? Uh, yeah, I like what Anthony's saying. When you do something for someone else, uh, there's no greater gift that than one man give his life for another. You know, that's what Jesus tells us, and that's what Jesus did, right? Gave his life for us. Um, put yourself in the path of the bullet for someone else. Would you do it? 
<clears throat> would you do it for your children? Would you do it for your spouse? Would you do it for your parents? Would you do it for a stranger? The person who would unabashedly put their life in, in place to protect someone else, that's the essence of happiness. The ultimate sacrifice of your life for someone else, to will the good of another, to will the good of another is really essence of true happiness. The essence of true happiness, even if that other person seems like they don't deserve it, but yet you're still willing to put your life uh, for theirs. I understand what you're saying. On one hand, I agree with it, but look at it. Members of the military put their lives on the line. All of us every day, they have a line. All kinds of stuff. Sure. Yeah, she's, if y'all didn't hear, she's, she's saying that members of the military put their life on the line and, and they don't always seem happy. Um, so let's not confuse the word happy with Shangri-La or Eden or life is easy on a bed of feather pillows. We as Christians have chosen the harder road. Much easier it is to follow that idea that the teenager had growing into adulthood, that now I get to do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whoever I want, and to live the carefree life. Christian, Christian, Christianity calls us to something different. It calls us to sacrifice. That's the harder road. Sorry to tell you guys, you have chosen the harder road. But you know, like the teenagers, all four of those, when you get to be 18, 19, as we do on college, I would probably say I you know, kind of drop out a little bit and enjoy the good life. But then they get a job, get responsibility, meet a spouse and whatnot, and they realize, you know, you kind of like change the world. You, know, you can't say it's a happy place forever. It, then it's not as, not as happy once you're there, you know, like. Kind of like going on vacation, you love to get there, but after you're there a little while, you're ready to come back home. <laughs> that's kind of how it was for me, you know. Once you get to a certain point, then it's it's not a choice, you do it. Well, I mean, it's it is a choice, but it's uh, it is, is, but it was like but you were conscious that way, that's so right. I always knew that just went back to it, yeah, that's that's, that's right. <laughs> But we were still taught it. Can you appreciate happiness? Okay, so yeah, good good question. They might have heard you. Uh, can can you appreciate the good if you haven't been through the bad? I would encourage you to read the lives of the saints. Some of them went through awful bad and were yeah. not good people. Some did not. Some lived a, a sanctified life their whole lives and yet uh, ended their life very happy. I knew this would be fun. <laughs> this is good. And it, uh, that discussion is a good uh, lead in to uh, the garden story, the Garden of Eden story, the story of creation. Uh, if you recall in the first two chapters of Genesis, there's two stories of creation, um, complementary stories, but two different stories nonetheless. In the first chapter, God creates the heavens and the earth, uh, he creates the water, he creates the land, he creates the animals, and these things, he, after he creates each one, he says it is good, it is good, it is good. And then he creates man, and he says it is very good. It is very good. This is the ultimate of good. Um, so we have our creator creating us and recognizing us as the best he could do. If you've ever tried your hand at artwork, woodwork, or tried to make something, whatever, and you finally kind of got it right and you were a little bit proud of it, you know, 
this a glimpse of what God uh, was feeling. You know, that I finally made something that is very good. Yeah, this is what I'm really proud of, us. And he settles them in the garden and he is with man. He is in good communication with us. And in the second story, more embellishes on the, uh, the Garden of Eden story um, that, you know, God created all the animals and he put man in charge of all the animals and everything was pretty good, but incomplete. So man, God creates woman out of the rib of man and they are together. And, and so they have that small community, man, woman, and God in good communication. That's the relationship that we seek. That is living the moral life one that is pleasing to God and one that is in communion with God. You see what I mean? That's what we're striving for. We're striving for getting back into the garden because what happened when we had it so good? We messed it up, right? He said, don't take of the tree of knowledge. And so what happened? Well, I'll tell you the man's perspective of what happened. <laughs> the guy was out doing man stuff and the snake the snake came up to the woman and said uh how's it going and he and she says pretty good and he says well i hear there's rules around here well yeah we can't eat out of that the fruit off that tree and the serpent tells her exactly what she wants to hear he's hiding something from you there must be something better there's something better than God and he's hiding it from you, you know? So he entices her to eat of the fruit. She does. And then she entices the man to eat and he does. And then God comes back to the community and something's wrong. Now, have you ever been in a family situation or friend or work situation? The minute you walk in the room, right? <laughs> Somebody is unhappy. Right. There's something wrong here. And you're like, is it me? Did I do something? You know, what, what happened? Uh, that's the feeling that God, God, something's wrong. Something's amiss. Something's they're hiding themselves and they should be glorying in themselves. And so uh, he confronts the man. So what does the man do? <laughs> she made me do it. And then he looks at the woman and, and she points to the snake. He made me do it. And God's like, uh, y'all just mess this up. And so he, he cast them out. He casts them out of paradise. He breaks the relationship of perfect communion that they had, but he doesn't abandon them. He doesn't abandon them. He cares for them. He clothes them. He feeds them. He tells them your life is going to be hard, uh, but I'm not going to give up on you. Uh, and he is true to his promise. And so ever since the garden, we as mankind have been trying to get back into the garden. And that, to me, is the essence of the moral life. It's our attempt to get things right with God. Question. I do. When you say that story like that, it almost, with everything that God created does, right? Mm -hmm. And he created man and woman. He put the tree there. So it's almost like he knew getting had it's going to be the first test. Don't break rule number one. I don't know how long they were there before they broke rule, broke, broke rule number one, but they did. And it's kind of like, I think that, might, that had to be his expectation, huh? Mm -hmm. So did they, did he know, did God know that it was going to happen? It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good analysis of free will, right? I heard something today, and it's crazy that we're talking about it. And I, it was just found me, it was choose your own heart. Choose your own hard. So it's Interesting. hard to refrain from that alcohol for free. Okay, that's hard. Then do another hard. I mean, it's hard to be broke. It's hard to be to get wealthy. You just gotta choose your own hard. Hmm. Interesting. I'll have to unpack that a bit more. Uh, if you run across the article, uh, share it with us. Um, choose your own hard. Yeah, so um, did God know that man, the man and woman would be disobedient? Would they fall to the 
sin of pride. I think you would have to know it. He said, hey, this is anything you want. Don't break this one rule. So think about this. You've got the one rule. Hey, do anything yeah. that you want. Is do not eat this. Right. So did he know? And if he knew, then why did he do it that way in the first place? I think it's the wrong question. I think the right question is, I think the right question is, what did God desire? What did God want? He wanted us to continue in the relationship that he set up. He wants perfection. We choose something else. What does God want with you today? He wants that right relationship. He wants your salvation. He wants to be in communion with you. It's your choice. That's what free will. Well, I think that's, that's what free will is all like, about. So it's to make a choice. And if you make the wrong choice, and then you got to do what's expected to, to overcome that bad choice. You know, it's like the day that it is. Get it's back in the garden. Choice. Every day is, you wake up with daily obstacles. If you, if you make one that's bad, hey, how am I going to? Go to, to, to get back into good graces and continue right. to strive forward. And to me, that that is so cath a Catholic way to say it because, like as in the Garden story, God did not abandon mankind. He cared for him and and wanted him back in the Garden. So once saved, always saved. Is that true or not true? Uh, does God uh, forgive and does He forgive always and perfectly? My the, the, the Catholic understanding is, yes, God forgives always and perfectly. Darren? I think that the alternative to what we're saying would be God would have had to create us, forcing us to love. It would not have been true love. Right. He had to give us will. Right. To choose that. Right. To be an automaton is the opposite of free will. Right. But what he was, what he was saying about points of Doing something wrong and having to fix it. The thing about it is, you have faith. You do something wrong, you recognize that it was wrong. That's what the faith is called. Because if you do something wrong, if it's right, then you're not wrong. So it's your faith in God that allows you to understand that what you did was wrong. Yeah. This brings up on this thing of God. Let's be honest at the Catholic. Right. Uh, God is omniscient. He knows everything. He is everywhere. But uh -huh. yet we have free will. So, you know, I have people always say, oh, he knows what you're going to do. Do it. Then that's not yeah and i and i think the problem with that conundrum is is that it uh assumes god abides by our time our sense of time and god does not it's as if in a crude sense he's already seen the movie he knows how it ends Particulars of the movie will be what they will be, but this movie ends the same way all the time. Um, rather than God as a puppet master, you know, uh, manipulating our every action. But that wades fairly deep into the philosophy of yeah, morality. That's, that's not what, that's not what about. <laughs> right. Um, good. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, this is what the church says about how free will works. A well-formed conscience, let's say it again, a well-formed conscience spurred by our passions and controlled by our virtues makes choices. A well-formed conscience, what does that mean? It means that we study ourselves on what is right and what is wrong. We don't, when you accept the good news, when you become a Christian, when you are saved, you're not, it's not, it's not like you pass through the colored lights and all the knowledge of right and wrong are suddenly imputed into your brain, into your soul, and you know what to do. Now, we do have a sense of natural law. We pretty much, we know it's not nice to steal from people. It's not nice to cuss someone out. We, we, we know that stuff. And like you're saying, 
uh, when you people turn to Christ, you, you, you know these things, but the intricacies of uh, becoming a truly moral person, we don't know all those things. We learn that. So a well-formed conscience is one that continually strives to learn and to know more and to have more of God revealed so that we become better people. A well-formed conscience. Now, spurred by our passions. Now, what are passions? What are what are passions? Things that what? Things that you know made of. Things that you are made of. Okay. Make you love. Okay. What else? Some people are passionate Think, hmm? about fishing. People are passionate about fishing. Huh? Uh, things, things that you, you strongly feel, believe in. To strongly believe in. Things yeah. you feel strongly about. Yeah. Awesome. Right. What do passions do? They motivate you to action. Right. So um, things that you feel strongly about motivate you to action. Uh, they may be good. They may be bad. Um, so a well-formed conscience spurred on by our passions and controlled by our virtues. Now, what is a virtue? Okay. Patience is an example of virtue. Right. Yeah. Things that are good about you, okay? Like what? Um, Being patient. Being kind, yep. Also, our learn. Yes. Sure. Patience is a virtue, right? But people, the phrase is you must practice patience. <laughs> so you have to learn how to be a patient person if you are not a patient person, right? Uh, you write ins, uh, good character or good behavior. Uh, they are similar, if not the same, as morals. Okay, good. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Good traits that you've learned your life. Your mama taught you <laughs> to do put your dishes in the dishwasher, you know, and you know, good habits. It's a good habit. That's all a virtue is, is a good habit. And a vice is a bad habit. So virtues and vices. Uh, we have to put on good habits and put aside bad habits. Uh, most doctors will tell you smoking is a bad habit, you know, so put aside a bad habit and put on a good habit. Don't smoke. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, say a kind word to someone every day. That's a good habit, but that's something you have to work at. I mean, you have to think about it, think what you're going to say. And this person, I really don't really have much good to say about them, but I have to think of something. That's a good habit that you have to work at, uh, being patient, being kind, being generous. Um, you know, those things uh, are good habits. And that is the nuts and bolts of morality, our virtues. So we need to recognize what are virtuous things that we do and say and believe uh, and things that are vices, things that are not good, things that are not what God would be proud of, things that you would not like to see a headline about yourself in the newspaper uh, that we have to put aside. That's the, that is the nuts and bolts of living the moral life, is building up our virtues and putting aside our vices, uh, whatever form they may be in. The good Christian continually examines yourself, your conscience, your actions, your thoughts, what you do each day, how you treat people, and, dis and discerns, are these good or not good? And if they're good, how can they get better? And if they're bad, how can I put them aside? That's the nuts and bolts of, uh, of, um, of morality or the virtues and the vices. Um, what does this phrase mean? Uh, to be a slave to sin. A slave to sin. What does that phrase mean to you?
forced to do something you don't want to do. Okay, your mind forces you to do something that you don't want to do. What does it mean to be a slave to sin? Can't stop doing bad things. Good, yeah. What else? Have you ever heard that phrase before? Oh, yeah. Slave to sin. What does it mean? Someone feels as if it's out of their control. Okay. Something's out of your control. Yeah. Say it again. Why is she can't stop doing that bad habit? Okay. Like the alcohol. Stop drinking. An alcoholic can't stop drinking. Yeah, good, good, good example.